Hi, I'm Dr. David Russ, chiropractor and neuromuscular therapist in Portland, Oregon. I made this video to help educate parents about what x-rays are needed to fully evaluate a scoliosis in a child or teen. I hope you enjoy it and learn something. If you have any questions or comments, please do use the comments section below. Thanks. So in this video, we're going to look at what x-ray views we need to assess a scoliosis in a child or teen and why we need them. Now let's, uh, let's start by saying that um, we always want to minimize the number of views we do for any patient. We want to minimize the exposure to x-ray. But you need the views that you need. And I don't think you're doing yourself or the patient any favors by leaving out views that would really help you make treatment decisions. So we minimize the number of views, but we do take all the views that we need. Just like when you go to the dentist the first time, they take a full series and they look at all of your teeth very closely. But when you go for a follow-up, they just do maybe what they call the bite wing, where they just take two views to look at your whole mouth. We do that for our scoliosis kids too. We start with a full set of x-rays and then we follow up with just one or two views every six to 18 months, really depending on the case. Now when parents come in with their kids, very often they have an x-ray that looks a lot like this one here. Um, where you don't really see very much. You can see that the patient has scoliosis. You can see that there's definitely a curve in their spine, uh, but we can't really see the top of their hip bones. We can't really see the whole curve, and we can't see any of their legs at all. We also don't have any side bending views where we can see how much flexibility there might be in this curve. So this is, <clears throat> this is okay as a starting point, um, but it's really, really not enough. So let's start. We, we start in the knees, and very often with, uh, with our scoliosis kids, we want to have a look at their knees so we can see if their lower legs are the same length. Now, any chiropractor or osteopath, physical therapist, or massage therapist can tell you that a person can have legs that are actually, you know, anatomically exactly the same length, but look different lengths because of asymmetry in muscle tone or pelvic alignment. And then there are patients who actually have different lengths of their legs. And if we take this view, and we call this the bilateral, which means both sides, A to P, which means front to back, knees. So this is a bilateral standing A to P knees. And both knees are taken at once on the same film. And we can look at this. We have a perfect horizontal here that comes off the right knee at the very top of this plateau on the knee. And on the left knee, it crosses higher. So that tells us that this left leg is actually, anatomically, a little bit shorter than the right. Now I'm going to emphasize here that an x-ray is just a shadow picture, and it's not a patient. So you have to correlate what you see on the x-ray to what you see on the patient. And in this particular case, and all these films are the same case, it's a 12-year-old girl, I measured her legs with a tape measure, and I could see that her left leg measured a little bit shorter. And we simply confirmed that here with this x-ray, and it's important to confirm that. Another important thing we can see on this film is you see these lines here and here, and in the lower bones here, 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 and here. These are called growth plates, and the fact that they're still a little bit open tells us that her legs are still growing. So we know that her whole skeleton is not mature, but we don't know just from looking at her legs how mature her spine is. So we look at the this next film here. This is not an actual patient. This is a specimen. Um, there's no guts in the way for that would be sort of obscuring our view here. But what we look at here is that the top of the pelvis matures in a very specific and predictable way. It starts out as cartilage, which shows up as black on the x-ray, and over time it turns to bone, which shows up as white or gray on the x-ray. And the bone starts on the outside and it works its way in. The cartilage turns to bone from the outside in, and then once the whole arc has turned to bone, the whole thing fuses to the rest of the pelvis. So if we see this line here, this black line, that tells us that it has not yet fused to the pelvis. And we give the patient a number, which we call the riser number, R-I-S-S-E-R, -S -S and it was invented by a doctor named Riser, that if the first outer quarter of the pelvis is turned to bone, that's a one. 
And if the outer half is turned to bone, that's a 2. So this patient would be a 2. If it was bone all the way to here, it would be a 3. If it was bone all the way to here, this whole arc is turned to bone, it's a 4. And if the whole arc had turned to bone and fused to the rest of the pelvis, that's a 5. A 5 is a skeletally mature pelvis, which is the same as saying a skeletally mature spine. And it's important to know that because once the spine is skeletally mature, the scoliosis is probably not going to get worse. And it's also a lot harder to make it better once the spine is skeletally mature. So let's look at the pelvic x-ray of our patient here. And it's a, you can see it's a lot harder to see because all of her intestines are in the way here. But you can see here she has a riser sign of 4 because it's turned to bone all the way from the outside in. But we still have this dark line between that arc and the rest of the pelvis, so it's not quite a 5. So she's a riser 4. And that tells me, in my experience, we have about a year to a year and a half before her spine is fully skeletally mature. Maybe less, maybe more, but probably somewhere in there. Now let's see what else her pelvic x-ray can tell us. Okay, the first thing I like to look at whoops, is how much rotational asymmetry is in the pelvis. And this is really important because if there's rotation in the pelvis, we have to deal with that before we can deal with anything else in the spine. And that could take three to six months all on its own. So we drop a vertical line through the center of the sacrum all the way down, and ideally it would pass directly through the joint here where the two pubic bones meet in front. That's called the pubic symphysis. Now on her, it passes just, just barely to the left. Now let's look at what an x-ray would look like if there was a little more rotation. Here we have quite a bit more rotation. This line dropped from the center of her sacrum, goes almost two centimeters to the right. Here this film is flipped around. This is the right side. It passes almost two centimeters to the right. That's quite a bit of rotation. On this film, again, uh, this one is, has the same orientation where this is the left side, almost two centimeters to the left, quite a bit more rotation. So if we go back to our 12-year-old, we can see actually that's very, very minimal rotation, and that's a good sign. Now let's look at what else we can see. Here's that same film. Uh, I drew a horizontal from the top of her right leg. Now remember, it was her left lower leg that was slightly short. But here, by the time we get to the hip, her leg is short by almost a full centimeter. And she's only about five foot one. So a full centimeter is pretty significant in someone of her height. Now, I'm going to get a little more into chiropractic um, x-ray interpretation, but we measure the height of her left hip bone, and we measure the, right of her, the height of her right hip bone, and the difference here, 21.81 centimeters versus 21.16 centimeters. It's about a 0.65 or 6.5 millimeter difference. Not to get too technical with you, but I can tell from the way all of this asymmetry looks that her right hip bone here has rotated backward a bit. And I know that's to compensate for the short left leg. How I know that is a, a question for another video, but that's something that we can see here. That there's very little rotation, but there is a leg length inequality of almost a centimeter, and that her right hip is doing a lot of the compensating. Now the next thing we're going to look at is the tilting. So here's a line straight across the top of her hip bones and another line straight across the top of her sacrum. That sacrum is, this is the base or the foundation of the spine right here. And these two, to the eye test, are pretty much parallel. And if we look at the angle of her fifth lumbar, that's this one, that's actually starting to tilt more. And the angle of L4 that's this one is tilting even more. So this tells us that her pelvis has compensated pretty well to the leg length inequality, but these two poor vertebrae are not compensating well at all. In fact, they're decompensating. They're making it worse. Now, I, when I examined her, I could feel that these vertebrae were very stuck and resistant to movement. So I know now from our x-rays a few things. Number one, there's a leg length inequality, an actual inequality where she's short on the left. Number two, 
Her pelvis is actually doing a pretty good job of compensating. And number three, these two lumbar vertebrae are doing a really poor job. And they're having some trouble moving. So this tells me that we can get somewhere in this patient by focusing our treatment efforts right here. Now it's also significant that she had pain in this area before we even started treating. This area was starting to hurt her. And pain in a 12-year-old girl is not normal. So I know that we're going to get somewhere. We're going to get some therapeutic benefit by helping these vertebrae adapt better to the short leg. We can positively affect her curves. Now the next film that we look at, it, this is more of your traditional standard scoliosis film. This is the A to P, which means front to back, standing thoracolumbar. And what we can see is the whole shape of her curve, okay? Here's L5, so it's overlapping with the pelvic film. And we see that her lumbar spine is curved to the left, and then it curves back to the right in her thoracic spine. And by the time we get up to her neck, it's about even again. But what this doesn't tell us is how much flexibility is in these curves, and that's very important because the flexibility tells us not only uh, how much room to improve we have, but it also tells us whether her spine will be able to adapt if we put a heel lift in her left leg. So we take front to back or AP films with the patient bending each way. Here she's bending left, and here she's bending right. And let's look at these films one by one. So again, standing straight, bending left, and we can see when she bends left, a lot of her lumbar curve goes away, a lot of the rotation in her lumbar spine goes away, and almost all of the curve in her thoracic spine goes away. So left side bending, we have a lot of flexibility. What we see here is that we have smooth side bending in her thoracic spine until we get here, and this is the ninth thoracic, or T9, and then boom, T9, 10, 11, 12, there's almost no movement. And then when we get back to L1 and farther down, it starts to move again. So she has what we call fixation here in left side bending between T9 and T12. So we know we're going to have to encourage and maintain some movement in this area in order to help her thoracic curve get better. Now when she side bends to the right, so again, here she is standing straight. Here she is side bending right. The rotation gets worse in this part of her spine with right side bending, but she has almost no movement from T7, T8, T9. Really, she's got a lot of trouble moving right here. So we can get a lot of therapeutic benefit by focusing on encouraging and maintaining mobility in this part of her spine. So we know a lot of things now just from taking these extra films. We know where we need to work. We need to work in her middle, and her lower thoracic spine. We need to work here where her lower back meets her pelvis. We know that her, her thoracic and lumbar spines are flexible enough to adapt if we put in a lift into, under her left leg. Now we wouldn't necessarily put in a lift of the whole 0.96 centimeters. We would use trial and error to tell us what would get us the best symmetry. So if you have any questions about what films might be needed for you or your child, or any comments at all about the video, please leave your comments in the comments section. I read and appreciate all of the comments. You can go over to my website, which is happyspinepdx.com, and read more about my approach to scoliosis, or click the link there to send me an email. I answer every email. So thanks so much for watching. I appreciate your time, and I appreciate your comments if you have them.